Okay, there's a special case that we want to take a look at. I just talked, spoke about you uh, creating a um, uniform field, and in practice, there's a specific situation that comes up a lot in technical applications where you have one disk that is positively charged. So we'll call this plus Q. And again, this is an edge on view of a disk. And another disk that is same dimensions and it's parallel to it, right next to it, but it has the opposite charge. So this is negatively charged. And there's a name for this device. Anybody know? This is a capacitor. Okay, a capacitor. is uh, the simplest capacitor is just two metal plates uh, side by side and then you connect them as we'll, we'll see later in the semester how you can actually the mechanism behind charging a capacitor but basically if you connect it to a, a battery you can drive current onto the capacitor and charge builds up on either side so you have uh, what's called a parallel plate capacitor specifically Two disks, opposite, same magnitude of charge on each side, but oppositely, op, uh, oppositely signed charges. And so we look at the electric field at various locations here. If we want to look inside the disk, say at an observation location in the gap in between them, uh, the electric field due to the positively charged disk is pointing what way? Pointing that way, right? So that's E of the positive charged disk. The electric field of the negatively charged disk is pointing the same direction, right? Because it's pointing towards the negative. If this distance, we'll call this distance S, which is the gap in between the two plates. If this distance S is small compared to the radius of the disk, we're not too far away from either plate, how do the magnitudes compare? They should be equal, right? They should be equal because we should be able to use, if we're very close to the disk, we should be able to use this formula as our approximation. Electric field mag of disk, magnitude of the electric field of a disk is Q divided by the area over 2 epsilon 0. There's no dependence on the distance, okay? So it doesn't matter where we are inside this, uh, this capacitor as long as we're fairly near the center part. Again, if you get toward the edge, the approximation breaks down. But if we're here, or if we're here, or if we're here, or if we're here, the magnitude of the electric field of the positive plate should be uniform. The magnitude of the electric field of the negative plate should be uniform. And so we add those two together. We know they're in the same direction. So we can say that the net electric field inside the gap would be equal to, in fact, let's write it as a vector. We're going to have Q over A over 2 epsilon naught, 0, 0 for the positively charged plate. And we're going to have Q over A over 2 epsilon naught, 0, 0 for the negatively charged plate. You say, well, what, what happened to the sign here? Isn't one positively charged? Isn't one negatively charged? Well, you got to be a little bit careful because, again, we're talking about a magnitude here. So that really is a magnitude. And so, as usual, I'm just looking at the physical situation to figure out what the direction of this vector should be. So, the magnitude of the field is the same for both, but it's pointing in the positive x direction for E positive, and it's pointing in the positive x direction for the field of the negatively charged plate as well. So, when I add those two together, I get Q over A over epsilon zero. So that's another useful result. Inside a parallel plate capacitor, the magnitude of the electric field is just the magnitude of the charge, magnitude of the charge on one plate divided by the area of one plate divided by the constant. 
Okay. So it's important here to realize this Q is the charge of one plate. The total charge of the capacitor is what? If I add those two charges together, I'd get 2Q. One's positive, one's negative. So the net charge is, is actually zero, right? So there's no net charge on the capacitor, so it's just a separation of charge. So the Q here is not the net charge. It's the charge of one plate. So the cap a capacitor is very useful. Well, it has a number of uses, and we'll see those as we go through the semester. It's useful technologically as for storing charge and storing energy, which can be used later on. Uh, but it's also useful for creating situations where we have a uniform electric field, okay? Because everywhere, almost everywhere, inside this uh, inside this gap, is provided it's a small gap compared to the uh, the radius of the plates we get an effectively uniform uh, electric field, okay? How close to the edge? Depends on how good of an approximation you want, okay? I mean, technically, even you move even a smallest away from the center, and this, you know, is not, strictly speaking, true anymore, right? So it, it depends. <laughs> it's, it, I can't really give a, a, a stronger answer than that. For our purposes, we're often going to be looking at situations where we just want to get the basic idea, and so we can often make this approximation. Okay. Yes? Well, is there, what's inside this gap? What's here? What's at this location? Nothing. Yeah, there's nothing here. Okay. So where is the charge? The charge is on the plates. Okay. The charge is on the plates. Well, we're, the question we're asking is, what is the electric field made by those charge distributions at locations inside the gap? Okay. Now, maybe I didn't answer your question, so what, ask it again. Oh, inside the capacitor itself, as in ins like, like here? Like inside? Oh, okay, so what I did was, all right. So I'm, I'm applying superposition. I'm applying superposition. I have two... I have a positively charged disk and a negatively charged disk. And I already worked out what the field is due to a single disk when I'm close to the disk. Okay? So I've got an observation location in here that is close to disk number one. So let's let's write it out maybe in stages. I have the net field, the net field would have to be the electric field due to disk number one plus the electric field due to disk number two, or I'll write it this way, the positively charged disk and the negatively charged disk, right? We're just, we're just applying superposition. So I say, okay, what's the electric field due to that positively charged disk? Well, I know how to deal with that. I ignore, superposition says I ignore the presence of the negatively charged disk. This, just think about the positively charged disk. I know its direction is in the positive x direction. And I know its magnitude is Q over A over 2 epsilon 0. Okay? So I have a vector then that is Q over A over 2 epsilon 0 in the positive x direction. All right? I do the same for the negatively charged disk. If I ignore the positively charged disk and focus on what's the field due to the negatively charged disk, well, it's in pointing in that direction, pointing towards the negative charge, and it's got the same magnitude because it's got the same magnitude of charge. It's got the same area. And there's no distance dependence here. If we're close enough to that disk, that's all, that's all that matters. Okay, so, we, so I know then that it's, it's the same formula. I have another factor of Q over A over 2 epsilon 0. And then 0 in the y and z directions. Add these two together, and I'm just going to get, if I add you know, 1 half of something plus 1 half of something, I can just get this back, right? So all, all, I'm, all I'm doing is adding two fields together, okay? Okay, questions?